Hello everyone and welcome to FE Cast. Berry Memories is live so you can go ahead and play with those cards and more cryptic information from Scarlatch. Here we go. Hello everyone and welcome to FECast, the official podcast of Friends of Eternal. I am one of your hosts, Sunnyvale, and along with me, as always, is fellow World 2020 competitor Stormblast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I love that you, you know, you ha- you're giving the caveat now of 2020 Worlds because hopefully there's a 2021 season that me and Sunny will both make Worlds again. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to the opportunity to qualify again, um, especially since like, you know, after... I guess you qualified pretty late, but for me, yes. uh, after that, there were all these tournaments that, you know, I would qualify for the top 64 and then just not play day two or play one round before having to go about my day. But uh, definitely looking forward to uh, competitive eternal again. I was actually talking to my girlfriend today and just saying how, you know, I feel like I'm just working and I'm not really working toward any goal. Like I'm working my job, but I'm not working toward any goal because there's no competitive eternal that I'm <laughs> doing. I'm not pushing a whole ton of content out. Um, so it was kind of a weird feeling, but uh, a new season will definitely change that. And I think that we're going to get some news about that soon. More on that later. First, let me give you a quick rundown of what we'll be covering today. Um, we have Buried Memories. We'll be talking about the rest of the cards that are in that. Stormblust and I will give you our top few picks to make Waves in Constructed. We say top three here, but I see you have four cards listed. <laughs> of course, we will update you with what's going on with Tuesday Night Eternal because that is competitive Eternal until we get official word from Direwolf. And obviously, aside from that, you know, we're excited that as of the day of this recording at uh, just uh, under, what, 10 hours ago? Buried Memories was released to client. We saw all of the new cards all at once, and we were able to play with them. Uh, Sonny, have you gotten a chance to play with uh, any of the new cards yet? No, I haven't actually played with them. I've just been trying to figure out the deck for uh, one of the new ones um, that is certainly very interesting. Um, but I haven't been in-game in, in, with any of these cards yet. I, 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 built, I built one throne deck with Hephos. Immediately was like, eh, I'm not feeling it. And then I built a deck with Volk, and I was like, this is the best! And uh, I just started tearing up the bottom, you know, go- the silver three to gold one, baby! Just, you know, the bottom of the ladder. But, um, but no, Volk was great, and I'm um, glad Forge Sanitizer finally seems like it's great, because it's always been great, but, you know, um, I-, I think Forge Sanitizer always was great. I, even- I think I even said that in the original uh the original spoiler view for. I think a lot of people were hesitant on it than I was. And the answer is, is that there just wasn't the kind of critical mass of sort of relic void interactions yet. And with Volk, which sort of, you know, has relic void interactions because it puts relics in the void. Um, I think that Forge Sanitizer might finally have its time to shine. And um, yeah, I mean, so, so uh, a couple fun things to do with Volk. You, you, you obviously, you play controlled demolition on Volk and you give it double damage and regen. And then you recur it, and now you have a 7-5 double damage regen, and you play Laser Blast on it. You deal, for one power, you deal 10 overwhelm damage. So you kill enemy unit, and you deal like 8 to their face, and then you attack them <laughs> double dam- you know, 14 damage. And uh, overwhelm is great, and uh, Volk is just fantastic. Anyways. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel good about you telling me that information, because it means I got a card prediction, right? Or at least so it seems, as far as we know so far. Yeah, but I mean, I can't. I can't imagine Volk ever gets too bad. It's so it's a lot better than say, um, what is that? Like the 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 three cost five five Sentinel and Fire that, that makes you discard a card when you play. Oh it. yeah, of course. It's just infinitely better. It's just so much better. Like just you know, even without its void recursion, just the fact that it has endurance and overwhelm. Yeah, and you don't have to discard a card is just is just better. And um, here's here's interesting interesting Volk interaction is Volk's heart is not attached to the specific copy of Volk. It can return any copy of Volk from your void. So I had a game where I silenced my opponent's Volk, and then that died. And then I played um, Flashfire on a different Volk, 
which then gave them a heart finally. And they were able to use the heart to return the silenced Volk out of their void. So it's not like Beacon of the Reach, I think, is the card, the one that makes you put random cards in your hand, but they're unique to each beacon. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so there, there are some interesting mechanical interaction with the Volk, but yeah, Volk, Volk was just crushing. Just like every time I played a Volk, I just felt so good about even playing Controlled Demolition on it. Because you get to recur the region as well. It's just, Volk's just nuts. It's just nuts. <laughs> you, you were it, it might be better than Hephos, honestly. Um, although, it, you know, I don't know. We'll see about that one. Yeah, but anyways, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll discuss that a bit later along with other cards. Uh, but we also have a Tuesday Night Eternal update, as always. Tuesday Night Eternal is chugging along fine. Uh, and, you know, I hope that you all are tuning in or participating yourselves. So, Sonny, would you like to tell us what the results of the last few Tuesday Night Eternals have been? Yeah, so uh, last Friday, I believe, uh, Beowulf won with Cruel Cure, and that's pretty awesome, like, from a personal perspective. Congratulations to Beowulf. But they posted a video of their gameplay in the piloting club, and I went through it and made a ton of comments. So could be coincidental, but also, if you want to up your game and maybe win some Tuesday Night Eternals, you know, record yourself and put a video in the piloting clubs to have other people look over it. It's tough to do because, you know, you're really exposing yourself there, but I think it pays dividends. And this past week on Tuesday night, Spifferific won with AP Kira. So a good week for Kira in Throne. Yeah, I would. I, I mean, I think that's that's an easy assessment to make. You know, as far as like level one decks post Silex nerf, the obvious answer is to, you know, go to Kira, right? Because now Arjun for Kira is a little bit uh, suffered more than um, Peru Kira because it actually has a Silex. And uh, there were moments in that Spifferific was uh, punished, punished, quote in quotes, by having Shadow Sigils in hand. I believe it was Spifferific who was punished with having Shadow Sigils in hand when they needed, you know, extra justice influence. Um, but as you can see, you know, obviously the deck is powerful and, you know, they managed to take it home even with some stumbles in certain games. Uh, aside from that, we also have uh, the Overmaster at Iplongo have secured their wild card slot. Uh, what this means is that the amount of points they have, no, there's not enough people with points close enough that they could overpass these two. So these two have clinched their wild card slots for the final invitational at the uh, end of the season. Yeah, so congratulations to these four for securing their spots to the Invitational. Next Tuesday Night Eternal is going to be February the 19th, so uh, mark that on your calendars. If you're interested in participating on a Friday morning, very early, uh, if you live in the U.S. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be um, for the, you know, the uh, Europe time, right? It's supposed to be for alternative time zones, which is nice that they're uh, allowing for other time zones have their day in the sun. Yeah. All right, uh, so this weekend, to celebrate the release of Buried Memories, there's going to be a Scion draft. I know that Cassendrith is very excited about this. I got an at everyone from him for being in his Discord uh, announcing this. And uh, this one actually has some pretty cool perks to it. If you enter in one of these events, uh, you're going to get a Rezon, an alt art Rezon. And the art is pretty dope. It's like what it looks like if Rezon is coming after you. And uh, if you can get five wins or more, you get an alt art reason. So uh, good luck to those of you who are chasing this art. And good luck to those of you who just enjoy Scion Draft. Yeah, I, I know that, that I already enjoy Scion Draft generally. But with these alt art reasons, you know, the real question is, do I, you know, clearly I'm just so good that I'll just get four premiums right off the bat. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, let, 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 I mean, let, let's just say that I do hypothetically, you know, do I do I just hypothetically draft great decks and then concede at like four wins to make to get four regular copies? Or do I just keep pushing it to get more alt art reasons and premium? Oh, what a pain. I mean, no. I mean, the answer is that, you know, with Scion draft, it's uh, especially first thing, it'll be very tricky to know which archetypes are actually the best. And also, you know, because it's, you know, akin to like MTG cube uh, where I have been known to force storm. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't often draft the best deck, so I don't necessarily expect to get four premiums right off the bat. Did you know, Sonny, that there is a card in the set, in the Scion draft called Soul's Rest, and another card called Sea of Teeth, and a final card called Volatility. Oh, God. <laughs> they put it back in the Scion draft just for me. It's tooth, tooth, tooth. Okay. <laughs> I am sorry for everyone who had to hear that. Uh, so it, it is kind of funny to me that Rizan is the uh, promo for this because it's a, <laughs> it's a, um, they say it's celebrating Valentine's Day, which I guess is also true. 
And Rizan is like the closest thing we have in internal to a Cupid, which is oh, is oh, is that what it is? Rizan, Rizan is... <laughs> so wait, so what happened? When Rizan was drunk. That was just no one falling in love in Miria. Rizan, was Rizan drunk on love? That's the question. Oh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm referencing. So there was the old graphical, uh, not issue, the old graphical quirk to Rizan. <laughs> where it, you, where whenever you try to target something with its ability, it would just target something completely off screen or not, something in the middle of the map. Just not what you meant to target visually. That was a pain to deal with because you didn't know which <laughs> unit to pump. Like it would just target the wrong unit. I, I think it was pretty consistent in how it did. Anyway, <laughs> that's a pretty good reference. That all took away Rezon's drinks and sobered him up. <laughs> So yeah, I hope to see some of you in the Scion draft queues because the more the merrier and it's a good time will be had by all. And, you know, if you, if you just want to get uh, regular copies, you know, any any run gets you a regular copy. Zero wins gets you a regular reason. You don't have to shoot for the premiums you don't want to. So, you know, um, I hope to see you all there. All right, let's talk about the rest of the cards in Buried Memories that we hadn't talked about in previous shows. So the first one's a big one, I think, and that is Midchief Celis. This is a two-cost double fire, 3-2 quick draw, amplify two, play Song of War. It's an Oni soldier. The Oni part feels like it might be more relevant than the soldier part, but uh, I think this card is really good. What do you think, Stormblast? I mean, yeah, it just looks clearly better than uh, Rakano uh, Outlaw, I think is the card, right? Yeah. Which had, which had they changed his voice line back in the day. It used to go, draw, mister, in a little high-pitched voice, and I thought that was adorable, and so I loved it. Uh, but they changed the voice line. They made it, like, significantly worse by, like, nerfing it in the voice line. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so basically you're trading a point of... You're giving... You're giving a, you're gaining a point. You're not trading a point. You're gaining a point of power, but you lose Warcry, but you can get that Warcry back for your whole team, and you get relevant unit types. Now, Gunslinger... I think it's a Gunslinger. Is a relevant unit type, but this one has potentially two relevant unit types. Uh, Sunny said soldiers less relevant, but you know we do have Janitor David, and he loves soldiers. Now, I think this card deserves to be fire fire. The fact that it is means that you can't just easily make a uh, what Ix- Ixtun uh, fire justice primal soldier deck because the influence on this card specifically is a little bit rough. But yeah, Song of War for two is is a pretty big deal because you know for free, right? Just extra value you know if you just have four power you can invest it into this card instead of having to you know use more cards in your hand i mean you don't have to right it's just a good card by itself but like you know if you just have a generic board and you want to play this instead of two two drops to try to get maybe some future advantage and not overextend onto the board uh also amplify means that you can you know play it for six and then do through two song of wars if you play it for 12 you can get 10 song of wars i mean five song of wars and we are approaching Song of War Tribal. We now have this card. We have actual Song of War, and we have Igen's Workshop. And we can say Shab, because Loot is an honorary Song of War. That's like 16 Song of War is there. <laughs> My goodness, that was a lot of useless information. <laughs> I think you're overthinking this. There are so many times in Fire Decks that I would have loved to have a two-cost double fire 3-2 quick draw, and that's all I'm looking at at this card, and I think it's great. It passes the Yeti Cookmaster test. Is this better than <laughs> Yeti Cookmaster? Yeah, it is. Um, it's definitely better than Clodagon's Ascending, right? Oof. That's 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 the Rip card that Clodagon. was like, is this good? But turns out that one doesn't pass the Cookmaster test, and this one does. So this is going to be played on turn two a lot, um, and it's going to kill a lot of people. This, in combination with the... Um, What's the uh the the Valkyrie that's a two one berserk f- flying reckless? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's it's yeah the two one Valkyrie that that summon plunder, uh, yeah. reckless rocketeer. I think is that what's called? I I do not remember what it's called. Raisin but... plundery bar. <laughs> <laughs> so that card and this card both really like scythe slash, and that I mean that's just going to kill people. Like this can attack through basically anything with a slice slash. Uh, the other one. The, the Valkyrie attacks for 10. Sorry, it actually attacks for 12 with the Scythe Flash. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Fire is having a good time here. And technically, the, the other card, there is a there is a bit of a synergy there because if you amplify and play Song of War, you can get two attacks off with the other Valkyrie for extra Warcry. Uh, now, that sounds dumb because it is it is not necessarily the most likely scenario because I think, I think this card's Amplify is relevant flavor text like exceptionally relevant flavor text 
but it is somewhat flavor text, right? You're most often just going to play this as a two cost three, two, like 90, 95% of the time, nine times out of 10, you'll be playing this card just as a two cost three, two for two with quick draw. But yeah. that one other time that you amplify it will be very relevant. I don't know about very relevant. So the the only time that you would actually amplify this is if you have nothing else to do with your power, in which case it might be too late to really have a big difference on the outcome of the game. Uh, but that it, you're right, it does have relevant flavor text because, you know, if you are, are missing curve or something on four and you play this with Song of War, that could be relevant um, as opposed to just, you know, losing two power and not doing anything with it. There's also potential if it, there's some sort of like spell synergy that, that maybe we'll see someday. Like if there's like, you know, fire card that's like gets power equal to the number of spells in your void or something. We get like an Alessi, but in fire, having a unit <laughs> that also makes a spell could be very relevant in that sort of aggro deck. Uh, so if something like that happens, the Amplify could suddenly see a, you know, a boost in utility, but until then it's still going to be mostly flavor text. Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, the next card on our list is also in fire. We're going, we're going in the classic faction order, so um, you'll you'll understand. Uh, is Flash Fry, and it's uh, just a generically good card. It's two and a fire for a fast spell, deal three damage to a unit, not face or sights, and give it Void Bound. It loses regen and can't regenerate this turn. So this is Seer, better Seer, but only for units. It's just this very solid card. It takes care of Volk entirely by giving it Void Bound. It gets the regen. It's just a solid card. I think this is worse here because it also doesn't deal with relic weapons. But there are going to be decks that would want this over Seer. If there is, say, a recurring unit that might be able to get regen easily um, that has three health. Um, and <laughs> I think there might be one or two of those that may or may not be relevant in Eternal. So I think this is going to be a relevant card. I don't think it's as good as Seer for the decks that want Seer. Um, but there are going to be some control decks that like this card more. I would agree that this card's worse than Seer, but in Expedition, we don't have Seer. So in Expedition, oh. I expect this card to be very good. Fair enough. I'm not. I'm still not well-versed in Expedition. I have not played it. I don't know if I've played Expedition <laughs> since Worlds. I just haven't had a big tournament to prepare for. All right, uh, so Flash Fry, solid removal spell. Let's go on to time cards. The next card is a five-cost double-time 5-6 five, beast. Roos War Beast. Summon, give a unit in Avoid Destiny and put it into your deck. Your other units that share a type with it get plus one, plus one. And there's one thing about this card that is pretty noteworthy. If you played Eternal way back in the closed beta, there was a card called War Elephant. It was a factionless card. And uh, this is using that artwork again. So I think that's pretty hilarious. Um, War Elephant got a massive glow up. War Elephant used to be just a five cost, <laughs> five, four overwhelm and now has this you know, legendary stat line with you know, legendary effect. It's it got a massive glow up, and you know, good for Warlven. You know, I can appreciate Warlven putting in the work and becoming a legendary. Yeah. So obviously, this card's pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, how how are you going to make use of this? I don't think there's a great way of utilizing this in constructive and in a competitive sense, but it does seem like there's some fun shenanigans that you might be able to do. Yeah. So the obvious, the obvious thing in this very set is we discussed uh, last week. Urid. Urid loving destiny. Uh, well, you know, Roos gives Urid destiny and puts it back in your deck, and then you draw it again, and then if Urid dies, then you get nine more destiny Urids. Uh, that's a lot of work for this, but um, but but also notably, Roos is uh, any void. It's not just your own void. So you can snag a key card of their void. You can snag the key Vara if they're playing Reanimator. Uh, if they're playing, you know, Volk, you can take their, you know, massive Volk and put it in your deck just to prevent them from bringing it back over and over again. Uh, I think the key, if you're going to play this, is you want to play with some form of unit tutors. We have um, Bugin's Choice, I believe, is the one that puts a unit on top of your deck in uh, in Rakano. Um, yeah. I, I, th I kind of think where I kind of want to see this is in some sort of, like, Dragon deck, where you play Dragon Forge to, at instant speed for three cost, you know, play the dragon that you put in your void and draw another card. Uh, so you can do it like the end of your opponent's turn, for instance, you know, and then attack with it immediately. I'm not sure what the best dragons are for that, but I kind of think dragons might be what this card fits into, but I don't know. It's got a wacky effect now on because on the base of it, the reason that Sonny and I think that, you know, it is unlikely to see much constructed play is that shuffling one card into your deck 
you are just not very likely to draw that. If you played against um, Milos and they shuffle firebombs in your deck, yes, sometimes you draw the firebomb immediately, but Milos really ha is not a 3-3. Three, three. Milos is a 3-Epsilon three, 3. That is to say that, you know, it's basically a 3-3 three, three because the <laughs> firebomb damage is effectively negligible because, you, you know, it's super random. You're just not super likely to draw it. So shuffling one card into your entire deck, which could be 50 cards, means that you're, what, 2% to draw every card each turn? That's just not very likely. Yeah, you mentioned Dragonforge in order to tutor it up. Also, Realign the Stars can potentially get a card that has Amplify. Not oh. a ton of units with Amplify, but that is another option. There's also Celestial Omen if you just need to pay six for something, or Rise to the Challenge. So maybe the best thing with that Amplify thing would be uh, that Ooze. The, there's a seven cost, seven, seven Ooze that has Amplify to play a copy of it. And that card's really bad because it's super expensive. But if you can make it cost three <laughs> and draw a card, and you know that you already have paid five, so you already can at least copy it once, and then you make two of them, and then you can, I don't know, play Dark Return if it dies or something, then amplify it again, that could be that could be something. Too many moving parts. Yeah, the, the real issue is that, like, reanimation effects already occur at five, right? We've got the Mandrake yeah. spell that costs five, we've got Near Perfect Imitation, we've got Grasping at Shadows, and, like... There are not very many worlds that putting a card into your deck with Destiny is going to be better than just having it in play, right? Like, best case scenario, you get it in play and you draw an additional card. <laughs> you get it play again right? eventually, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, actually, it's just the same if, if you draw it immediately, which is not very likely. So, right. I mean, Destiny is just, like, such a crazy mechanic that, um, you know, they have to be careful with it and they can't make it too good. So, so like, this is probably just going to be worse than those reanimation spells but it's it's really interesting to think about yeah because it makes it's kind of it's kind of like the piercing grief effect um it does, <laughs> obviously this card's a lot better than piercing grief but my thought on piercing grief has always been that it's the card it's the worst card in the, obviously you get it for free off of severin that's a whole different story but like you're just playing it straight up it's the card that does the least in the game that most people played especially back when it's first released because it tricks you into thinking it does the most because you know you play it you attack immediately, you get to gain three life, you get to, you know, deal three damage, it gets to go, then it shuffles into your deck and sacrifices itself, then eventually you, you gets to replay itself, attack again, and you get to draw another card, and you get another three life, and you deal another three damage, all while, meanwhile, nothing's actually happened, you just spent a card to effectively, you know, deal six and gain six or whatever, and over, like, six turns, it's just so bad. Now, this card's obviously better, because, base case scenario, it's a five cost, five, six, it has an actual body, but Destiny can help trick people into thinking that cards do more than they actually do. You think of this as like a grasping at shadows, you know, delayed grasses you have to jump through a bunch of hoops for that comes with a 5-6, you know. You're putting in a lot of effort for just a 5-6. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to use this fairly that's going to be good. Like, if you're playing some sort of tribal deck, but it's a beast and that's not a very common tribe, so, like, you'd have to split tribes on, on this card. Like, maybe if there was some sort of grenadin or totemite thing going on but i i really just don't think so i i don't think that's gonna work it has out. a secondary effect oh yeah it has it has a random pump effect <laughs> yes that's right that's right it's an eternal card it's an eternal legend of course it has a random effect on it um i guess it oh is the is the is the is the law is the flavor that it's a, a war beast so it's carrying the unit into battle and you know inspiring the others of its tribe or something is that is that the flavor here that makes no sense to me I'm trying. I'm look. I'm reaching here. I'm. Uh, what? What? Why is? Why does a war elephant shuffle units and give them destiny and then make other units bigger? Okay. You're always reaching. Okay. Next card. Impound. Impound is a one cost time spell. Impound says kill a relic on the enemy player. Impound can't be stopped by Aegis or draw a sentinel from your void. So this is a really interesting card to have. It. I don't think it's going to be that good, but it does place a check on strategies like World Pyre or like Sling of the Chi that rely on using Transpose to protect a very central uh, relic or like Throne Room, right? It's a check on those types of strategies in case any of them get too good. Now, I don't think any of those strategies are running rampant right now, but it's like an interesting way of, of keeping a check on it. I'm not sure how I feel about that because, um, well, I don't know. I, I just like various strategies being viable and and this kind of like shuts down most most strategies that would involve relic plus protect it 
Um, but on the other hand, maybe Relic plus Protect it just like doesn't lead to good gameplay scenarios, which is a possibility I'm willing to entertain. Um, so I'm like really torn on whether I think this card is a good thing to have in the game because it provides a check on a type of strategy or if it's bad because it just provides a check on that strategy and makes it so that those can never be too popular. I think it's actually a very interesting point. I think overall I like having checks on strategies. So I think this card is probably if I didn't think about how it deals with a bunch of these single relic tries, I was just thinking about how it deals with, you know, rat cages and stuff and Volks. <laughs> um, like, like I gotta get rid of those Volks, those Volk hearts. I got Volk on the brain. Um, I'd say this card's flavor is good. Look at it. It's a flavor. It takes something away or, you know, it gives you back something from the pound. It, it's got flavor all over. Unlike that War Elf earlier. I'd say flavor is important, Sunny. And I will look as deeply into the flavor as I want to. Anyways, I think this card's potentially main deckable in a Sentinels deck. It obviously, you know, you put it in like the market of a deck, potentially. The main impediment between main decking this would be the card Restorative Process, which, you know, is a similar card that, you know, costs two. But it also draws a attachment from your void, so you'd have to be sort of playing a Sentinel deck that's not playing attachments or does not care about recurring attachments, which... With the advent of Volk, if you're playing a Time Sentinel deck that doesn't care about attachments, seems kind of iffy. So maybe this would be in like the market, in a time market for a deck like that. I'm not exactly sure. It, the fact that you know it's a it's a choice card makes it powerful, but you obviously have to be playing Sentinels for that choice effect to happen. Obviously, you probably aren't gonna play this by itself. I guess it's slightly better than the From card that's just one cost kill and a relic at fast speed. So this, this is not fast speed, but going through Aegis is a big deal, as Sunny said, right? Because we have seen this transpose action in the past. Uh, notably, this doesn't kill cursed relics, though. So if your opponent plays um, the six cost one that, that ramps up, what is that card called? Uh, restrained action? Restrained action. If they play restrained action, you can't kill it. However, I do believe that if you play a cursed relic on your opponent, you can kill that. Because that is a relic on the enemy player, which could theoretically be relevant. So... In my experiment with Volk this morning, I found a card called the Angelo Strongman. Strongman indeed. I think it's Strongman. It's a three cost four one rogue that has Entomb. Play a urn of choking embers on the opponent. It's an aggressively statted unit, perfect for some sort of you know aggro-ish type deck like Volk might be with its aggressive stat line. And it puts a random relic on the opponent that can help with aggression future or to be sacrificed for Volk. Now, now this is my reach here. So it dies and you put the urn on the opponent. You impound the urn, so your forge sanitizer becomes a 5-5. Five five. Now, that is awful, but it is a very funny interaction. Uh, so what do you think of my awful, my awful interaction here? You know, I never would have thought about it, but the fact that you can grow your uh, forge sanitizer, like, that could be relevant. Like, you just need to get the extra few points of damage for the last attack. So, uh, as much as I would love to facepalm for that, I, I think that's useful information. All right, let's move on to some of these justice cards. Uh, the first one of which is Smite. Two cost justice, fast spell, kill a unit with different attack and health. Current health. So uh, this plus a Relic Weapon is going to be able to kill anything. Um, it already kills a lot of cards. I feel like they've been releasing a lot of cards with different attack and health recently. Yeah, I think this is just going to... Like, you'd have to do a breakdown of what the common cards are in the format, but I have to imagine this kills enough things, and you can combine it with any source of damage to kill anything, and that makes it good enough for competitive play. Yeah, my, my early inside sources have indicated that Smite might be very good, which I wouldn't necessarily be surprised by, especially in Expedition. Having just alternative options for removal spells is powerful. Just, you know, just, just being able to tailor your removal to the metagame, I think is really, really nice because it also enables rewarding, uh, keep, you know, good deck builders, right? If you have to choose between removal options, you choose Just Desert, Smite, Vanquish, Edict of... Kodosh, you know, which, what, you know, justice two cost removal spell you're going to put in your deck. I think, you know, being able to be rewarded for knowing the metagame and knowing what removal is best right now, I think is, is a nice thing to have in Eternal. So I think that, you know, if this card cost one, I think this would be like, you know, not necessarily a power creep, but would be just like, you know, substantially better than a lot of other justice removal. But costing two puts it in line with a lot of the other conditional justice removal. 
Um, one interesting interaction here that I think will come up quite a bit, especially in expedition style control decks, is with a uh, Lord Styre's Tower. If you have Lord Styre's Tower, you can effectively kill anything because Lord Styre's Tower, the curfew enforcement, gives enemy units minus one, minus O, or you can amplify it to give, you know, extra minus one, minus O's. And the fact that you can tailor, that means that you can basically make it so Smite can kill anything. So being able to, say, shrink your your opponent's board by three attack and then killing their largest thing that still exists, I think could be exceptionally relevant. I think this card's just, just like Flash Fry, it's just a good, powerful removal spell that we will see in Expedition a fair bit. Yeah, I suppose I was thinking about uh, Flash Fry and, and how it kills things with regen. If you do have a source of damage, you won't necessarily going be able to kill something that has regen that has equal stats. But thinking about the regen cards, I feel like most of them have unequal stats anyway. That's beside the point. Yeah, I, I think that this is going to kill a lot of things. Let's move on to the next one. The next one is a three-cost Sentinel Injustice. Uh, it's a 3-3 Fort Smasher. When Fort Smasher hits the enemy player, play a unit with cost three or less from the top three cards of your deck. Discard the rest. Um, to me, this seems like a card that could be reasonable in, in Expedition. I think it's behind the curve in, in Throne, though. I don't think it's going to see any play there. Yeah, when we discuss our next card, I think the next card might pair very well with this card uh, when we talk about it. But um, this card has a powerful effect. You know, you could sort of almost compare this to um, the three cost three three that when it attacks, you draw a justice sigil. Except that this card's, you know, this card's similar in that it's a three cost three three that has a sort of attack card draw effect. But this card is different because it has to hit the enemy player, and then it has a much more powerful effect, right? In a lot of ways, you can compare this card's uh, a hit trigger to, you know, Jan or David, um, in that, you know, a lot of your soldiers are obviously going to be units with that cost three or less, just because that's just how the deck functions. And the fact that, you know, this card, you know, it, instead of just drawing you, play it outright, which is obviously better in most cases. Um, you know, if you hit, if you imagine hitting with Fort Smasher, then, you know, playing a Mavelof Hunters off the top and then attack killering with 5 4 attack, right? That sounds excellent. It's the top three cards of the deck, though, so you obviously have to be building towards this card. You have to have a lot of cards that cost three or less units specifically, because three is not necessarily that many. Discarding cards is also useful, though, so it's not like that's the end of the world if you just discard a bunch of stuff that you can then utilize that aspect of it. Uh, I think this card is potentially very powerful. You know, three cost, three, three is not necessarily the best stat line ever, but it has a very powerful uh, on-hit trigger. So I could see this card trigger, and it has a relevant unit type in Sentinel. Yeah, I mean, if you hit with this and you get a three drop from your deck and your opponent isn't playing with sweepers, the game's probably, like, close to over at that point. It's such a ridiculous swing. Um, but you have to keep in mind, a third of your deck is already going to be power, and then you're going to have some interactive elements that aren't going to contribute to uh, hits off of this card, and it's only three cards. So, I mean, this is really... This is this card's really swingy, one way or another, right? I, just to reference, just to reference a bit of math for for the janitor over here. Um, janitor is top four cards in your deck, and uh, the rough calculation that I did was that if you have twenty four cards in your deck, you have approximately an eighty percent chance to draw a card with janitor. This card being top three means that you know if you have twenty four units that cost three or less, this card is less likely to hit and draw a unit than janitor David. So you might need to have like twenty eight units that cost three or less. Now the, the upside there is that unlike with the janitor fort smasher itself can you know play a second copy of it so you so it counts itself for that unit thing so it would be you know effectively you'd only need um to play what 24 other cards so just like the janitor roughly uh you need to be playing 24 other hits for fort smasher just like how janitor needs 24 other hits for itself so you can kind of think of it like that although it, the math might need to be worked out a bit more massaging yeah all right so this card would be greatly helped if it had some evasion um, particularly from a card like this next one, Jetpack. Jetpack is one cost Relic and Justice. Once per turn, you may pay two to give one of your units flying this turn. If it hits the enemy player, they can't play spells until your next turn. After the third, you sacrifice Jetpack. So this is pretty interesting. It's it's pretty expensive to a turn to give something flying. Um, seems just worse than Elder's Feather to me because... Uh, you, they still get to play spells on your turn. So they can still play fast spells like Smite or Flash Fry. Um, but I guess if there are powerful slow spells that a deck wants to play, like it could really put be a thorn in the side for that case. I don't think that this is going to be very good unless you have uh, 
reasons to want a one cost relic, like strong reasons to have a one cost relic. I don't think that like just playing it at face value is is good enough. Um, but Stormblast, you sound like you might have a, a use for this. Well, you were just saying that you know you you, met, you mentioned Fort Smashers. If only it had evasion, but you also said you know Fort Smasher if it hits in and then it plays a unit, you know, the opponent's just dead if they don't, you know, the opponent just is kind of get buried soon if they don't have some sort of sweeper. Well, if only your evasion could also deny your opponent playing sweepers at the same time. I think this card is fairly powerful, especially in, say, Expedition, where, uh, you know, relics do matter. You know, it's relics that sacrifice matter. Uh, just having the extra relic left around you. Know, like, I have played this. I put it in the market. I'm not sure if it's a main deckable card. It might, it might end up being, I don't know, I've seen people that are main decking it. But, it seems um, so bad in multiples. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I think I think you'll, you don't need it in every matchup as well, so I, that's why I like it in the market. It's a situational effect, so I put it in the market. It's also a cheap cheap situational effect, which also makes it good in the market. Um, like, you know, I gave I gave my Volk flying and I attacked in, and the next turn my opponent killed the Volk, and so then I just activated Volk and I sacrificed that jetpack to bring back my now larger Volk. Um, and it was just, it was just you know, a fine little exchange there. You know, I... I delayed them. They killed my Volk, and then um, you know I um, I just got just got value off the jetpack on the, on all the angles. Uh, it's interesting the jet. I guess oh is oh the flavor of the jetpack is that it runs out of fuel. Is that the flavor <laughs> of it? You run out of fuel, then it breaks apart. <laughs> I guess so. I love that we have a card called Jetpack in Eternal. Like that, that's just a fun thing, right, Sonny? Yeah, that is. Who doesn't love jetpacks? Um, I guess you're right. Like it does seem like it could be situationally very good. I, I could see this being a like reasonable mark card for for decks that can use it multiple ways. That's the kind of card that I like in in uh, in Eternal in a lot of ways because you know making us have to have hard deck building decisions is is really excellent and you know having to utilize situational cards like that's why I love markets. If markets didn't exist, if even if it was like sideboards, I don't think this card is like a sideboardable card in a lot of cases. And like you like match. I mean, maybe it would be in certain matches, but I really like that in markets you can you know tailor what you need for the given situation you don't have to like put it in your deck and you know hope to draw it where you might not need it at that given point in the game state if you were playing a sideboards i think that you know this card's a better market card than it would be a sideboard card if eternal did have sideboards okay let's go on to the primal cards uh our next card is a four cost relic double primal bracers of subdual this has a lot of text at the start of your turn sacrifice bracers of subdual to draw a card for each different health among your units at the end of each turn play a beast with plus one for plus one for each card you played oh it's each health among your units for some okay for whatever reason i read this card as each different unit type among your units i have no idea why but that is what i read that card as I, this this card's just pretty crazy. I mean, yeah, maybe you could see it drawing a few cards for you, but you have to wait for your opponent's turn in order to draw the cards. I guess you do get a pretty good payoff after that because you can get like a three, a two two, or a three three beast after it. I don't know. Actually, that doesn't sound very good to me. So, like, draw a couple cards maybe if you have a board, and get a beast if you play cards after that. So, I think this one's pretty unspectacular. <laughs> Oh, it's play. Wait, for each card you played, not each card you drew. Yes. I was thinking with each card you drew. Okay, so now you're learning, by the way, FE Cast, that I misread everything about this card. <laughs> I misread how it drew cards, and I misread how it played this beast, but I did read that it was, in fact, a beast. That is the one part of the card that I read properly. Um, so I was sort of equating this to, in my head, was to um, Helio as sort of like, you know, a draw to play a 2 2 as just being good enough, but. The fact that you have to play cards means that you have to sort of extend onto the board. So it, but you're already playing units, so you already are extending onto the board, anyways. The thing about this card is this card could potentially, potentially be one of the best cards in the set. No, it's terrible. I mean, I think that it's probably bad and awful, but I could see it being very good. Is my point. Okay, you have to somehow you have to assemble a board and then keep it intact for an entire turn, yeah, um, while not advancing it in order to get any sort of payoff with this. The thing is that, you know, how many cards would you have to draw and how much larger of a beast would you have to play for that risk to be worth it? And, I mean, you can't even necessarily guarantee that it would draw two cards, especially if you're playing it on curve, which is when you'd want to play it. Uh, although I guess it would be not terrible out of curve because it is drawing cards or whatever. But either way, you know, and, and we'll get back to this later with a card, the final card that we're going to review. I think this card is somewhat comparable to that card. So when no. we get there... Uh, this is bad. <laughs> no, no, this is no, no, just the, so the, bad. 
No, the final card. I think the final card is exceptionally comparable to this card. They're, they're very similar in many ways. The fight, the final, the final card, the factionless card, Sunny. Yes, I disagree. I think they are very different, and this is much worse. Okay. Well, well, when we get there, we'll discuss it then. So, moving on to this next card, okay. we have Refraction, a three primal primal fast spell. Play a copy of an attacking enemy unit. Sacrifice it at the end of turn. Uh, a lot of cute stuff you can do with it. Maybe mark it, but. I'm just going to go quickly on this one. I think this card is just bad. It's just expensive and too situational. Yeah, this would be a really interesting limited card, but I think in Constructed, it's it's really bad. Let's move on. The next card is a 5 cost, 5-3, five, Flying Regen, Bird Beast, Evolving Olzeal. I don't know how that's supposed to be pronounced, but we'll go with that. When Evolving Olzeal hits the enemy player, draw two cards, then discard two cards. Summon, you may transform a relic or sight into a 4-1 soldier that can't block. Uh, so a sight killer, um, something that can potentially deal with relics, but also something that just dies flash fry and smite. And so I don't think this card is going to be that great. When I first saw it, I was like, whoa, this is really good. But then I think they spoiled flash fry and smite afterward, and it dies to both of them straight up without doing a whole ton. And a 4-1 soldier, like that's going to be attacking you. That's a big deal. Yeah, the, if it, for this card to be good, you'd have to be relying on it summon trigger to do things. Now, I want to go back to flavor for a moment. What is this flavor? I, I can sort of get the turning a relic into a soldier, you know, like, I guess you're, like, building an automaton or whatever. Uh, but, like, you're turning, like, I'm turning, you know, the speaking circle into a soldier. You know, I've been turning... Um, turning howling peaks? Yeah, yeah, like, like, what's the flavor behind turning a sight into a soldier? You're not like polymorphing, you know, you're like, like, here's this whole giant thing, you know, let's take all of, like, Arjun port and let's just smash it into a soldier, like, what? Uh, so the flavor of this card's a little bit whack, but, um, but that's okay. Um, uh, I think potentially the most interesting way to use this card would be on your own relics. I don't think there's enough of that to be out there, but, like, if there were relics that you, like, if you, like, use Jetpack twice, and then you, you use that third use into the 4-1, like, I think that might be the best use for this, because it gives you, you know, a pretty substantial board presence, a 4-1 and a 5-3. Flying region for 5 cost is nothing to scoff at. I just don't think that that sort of effect in game plan is anything a deck is looking for, or if there's relics to support that idea. Um, but I think that's where we'd go with it. Like, I guess it's also cute with, like, the speaking circle because, or, or it sites that pop and you don't care about their uh, abilities anymore because if they pop, then you can use them the site. But obviously, sites don't necessarily pop that much. Um, so just a, overall, just, like, an awkwardly situated card. Yeah, it's certainly powerful. I wonder how it works with Cursed Relics, although I think your opponent would get the soldier, right? Well, it depends. If you played the curse relic on the opponent, you'd get it. But if they played yeah, it on okay. you, they should get it. I believe that was how it worked. Although, you know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe if it didn't, that would be really funny if this card just randomly hosed cursed relics. Although, although actually, cursed relics are the one thing that you put on the opponent that oftentimes you, you're just, like, free to take off the opponent. Uh, and you wouldn't mind that much. So maybe cursed relics are the way to go with this card. Um, it's an interesting effect. It, it has sort of a powerful on-hit effect, but it's also kind of... It's weirdly not vulnerable at the same time being weirdly vulnerable. Like, it, it's, it dodges a lot, but also is vulnerable to a lot. It's like Senate Agent kills it. If this card was multi-faction, then it might even be more interesting, because then it at least would dodge Senate Agent or Annihilate. Yeah, well, I mean, now it's also dying to Flash Fry and Spike. Yeah. So, like, even in the Expedition... I kind of agree. The common removal is going to target it. Yeah, yeah. If, if it finds a spot where in the metagame where there's not a ton of removal that can hit it... I think it can do a lot of work. I think it's a very impactful card, but I just think that a lot of the time it's just going to eat two cost removal, and that's pretty bad. If you're playing a uh, five cost card that eats a two cost removal that you know gives your opponent board presence, that's not a good exchange, which is, again, why I think that you'd have to give yourself the board presence, but that state is hard to do. So anyways, moving on, we're moving into Shadow now, which is, uh, they, they got a little bit shafted compared to the other factions as far as interesting cards and good cards. Um, so the <laughs> next card is, Hired Muscle, it is a 5 Shadow Shadow 6-4 Giant Rogue, so two almost irrelevant unit types. And one of your units with two attack or less attacks deal one damage to the enemy player. So every time you attack with a Grenadine, it deals an extra damage effectively. And then it also has Valkyrie Warp Lifesteal. So all in all, this card is awful. It gives us Valkyrie again. It tells us that Daryl was not done with that mechanic. 
and the card's also just not that although although actually I guess the the synergy is that you know when it gets life steal then it's it's a attack trigger because it's dealing the damage you gain the life back ooh it's so fancy and synergistic with itself but this card's gross I don't like it yeah let's not legitimize it by discussing it further yeah next card's actually probably the most interesting shadow card of the set dark purveyor is a four cost five three double shadow cultist the first time you deal spell damage each turn play a one one grenamender summon give one of your other units plus one attack for each unit in your void so it simultaneously um makes a small unit into a big threat well potentially and while providing fodder and um the night before this was released i guess that's last night geez it feels like a really long time ago for some reason um i i saw the boxer tweeting out uh i really hope there's some grenadin good grenadin fodder in this set and this is the closest thing we have to it and i don't think it's good enough but it's i mean like it's interesting it's i i don't know if there's enough spell damage that you can just keep on firing off that will trigger this in order to get an army of Grenamenders, and even if there is, if that's good enough, because Grenamender is not very exciting. I really wish this card wasn't the first time, it was just every time. I mean, I, you know, I guess I guess that they're trying to put a safety valve to, you know, not make sure nothing goes crazy, but, like, this card probably could have been safely any time you deal spell damage, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I really like this card as a design. Uh, a lot of people like, it's, it's like, a lot of people like, it's really awkward because you, you play it on four, and you're not going to have any units to pump up, and I'm and I'm like, well, I see it a little differently. A, you, you might have some use in the void. You just incidentally get some value turn four, maybe that'd be great. But I see it as the first ability is good in the early game, and the second ability is good, you know, or early mid game, whatever. The second ability is good later in the game, right? When I say better early, it's because the one ones are going to be, you know, probably more effective early when you want the sacrifice fodder earlier, and the fact that uh, you're not going to, you know, have you're going to have the spells in hand in the early game, whereas later in the game you might not have spells in hand anymore. And then uh, the second ability is better in the late game because that's when you're going to have a bunch of units in the void. So, you know, it's kind of like the the classic thing of, you know, what makes a two-drop good is, a, it, a, you know, good early. It's good late. Like Yarl, you know, Yarl is good early in that, you know, it can draw a card or become a 3-5. And then late game, it can kill the opponent, right? That's why Yarl is so good, you know. Uh, Wump is great because Wump starts dealing one damage to small things and then becomes a 6-6 six, six really quickly. You know, having that that's sort of the benefit. Like, Maveloff Huntress, you know, it can kill small things early and then later you can aim you onto bigger units and then kill big things so uh units that can do double duty are very good in that capacity the, the thing is though this card is very expensive like if this card was at two cost two two i mean that might be just way too good and if it was a two cost two two then i could see you know only the first time you deal spell damage but being four cost i think they could have relaxed the first time element to it but i think this card is, is a really good design i and i hope it gets there because i do love the design you know, it, it's actually pretty big, like 4 cost 5-3, it's not winning any awards for its size, but, you know, it'll end a game quickly if left unchecked. A little bit earlier, you were saying that, you know, a 5 cost 5-3 flying region was bad because it died to all the common removal. This card does the same thing, it does die to all those common removal you pointed out, flash fry and smite and, you know, regular 3 cost damage, you know, it dies to everything that, that uh, the evolving Olzeal does and more. Fair enough, but it does cost one less, and it's we're true. talking about all the other um, utility it has, right? We, we've been talking about it in completely independent of its body size. All I'm saying is, like, it might have enough pieces of the puzzle to get there. I think it falls short, but it's like, I think it's actually surprisingly close. So the final card is a weird one. Uh, it is a four-cost spell called Might of the Bastion. If you have a Grenadine, deal three damage if you have a mandrake draw a card if you have a sentinel play a random power card from your deck if you have a soldier your units get plus one plus one if you have a valkyrie gain five armor so basically for each of the five main unit types if you have it in play you power up the spell so if you have all five in play you get all five effects at once i'll think i think this card is is bad and i'll let sunday talk about it first Oh, I love cards like this. I don't think it's good, but I just think it's a lot of fun because uh, it, it could lead to like some really interesting deck building and you get a little bit for uh, each unit that you've managed to assemble. I don't know if you've played the card in Magic Last Stand, but that was one of my favorites. It's terrible, um, but essentially for each faction that you have, uh, you get a little bonus. And that was one of my favorite cards growing up. So I have a lot of nostalgia for cards like this. 
I think if you can do Grenadine Sentinel uh, regularly, it's actually not bad. Or, or like maybe Grand and Mandrake or all three is is interesting. The, the Soldier and Valkyries I'm a lot less uh, interested in. But it seems like a fun card for those looking to have fun with it. And uh, I don't think I'm ever going to put this in one of my decks. <laughs> My problem with this card, I think that if you can if you can guarantee any three effects outside of perhaps Sentinel, Soldier, Valkyrie as the, as a three effect combination, any three combinations of these effects, I think is probably very good. the The downside, of course, is that you can't guarantee, even remotely guarantee, that you're going to have three effects uh, of these units because you have to have the units in play. Now, there are some Granite and Mandrakes, but they aren't very good. We have a like what like Blight Pedal or something. Uh, a three cost three three that you know gets a bonus if you like sacrifice a unit on your turn or something it's a very weird card um you know the thing is that if we had a card that was just four cost spell deal three damage draw a card i think that card would be very very good even though it is you know a little bit expensive i think that card would be very effective this card is not that even if your even if your deck is full of grenin and mandrakes because you have to have both a grenin and a mandrake in play the opponent has to not kill them uh, especially if you know if if any if the deck ever becomes good with this in it, then everyone will know to just you know ensure they only have one unit type in play. The downside is you know, you have to have they have to have the units in play. And the reason I compare this to the other card, the Bracers of Subduel, is they're both four cost benefits. They're both four cost bonuses that rely on you having units in play. You have to have enough units in play for both of them, right? So if you if you have two units in play, you get two effects off the that might. If you have two units in play, you get to draw two cards off the bracers. Kind of, sort of, maybe. Because it's it's conditional what units you have in play for the bracers, but it's also still conditional what units you have in play for the might of the bastion, right? I think they're both probably terrible, and I don't really care to try to analyze which one's worse. But that is why I think that they're similar cards, Sonny. Well, the reason why I think the other one's so much worse is because you give your opponent an entire turn to... Yeah, that's fair. All right. So that's the rest of the cards from Buried Memories. We're going to go through the cards that we think are most likely to impact Constructed. I said top three cards, but I see... Oh, nope, there's still four cards in... Nope, there's... Well, okay, you're cheating. <laughs> All right, top three cards from Buried Memories that are going to make an impact in Constructed. My three are Midchief Salas. As someone that's played a lot of fire decks, I would have loved a 3-2 quick draw so many times. I definitely would have played it in the place of Yeti Cookmaster. And it's just... Yeah, that's. I think it's a slam dunk for, for aggressive fire decks. Uh, Logistics Expert, which is the one cost time unit that gives you plus one maximum power. It also has Amplify in order to give itself plus four, plus four permanently. Um, I think that's just pretty good. I, I, well, I mean, it's fantastic. It's fantastic on turn one, but um, I think it's definitely got good scalability. And I think that it's going to be in a lot of decks. And finally, my third is Volk, which Stormblast raved about early on in this episode. I think we're going to see a lot of Volk, and I think the format is going to revolve around Volk uh, to some degree. I think it's going to be a big player for uh, for a while, as long as the power bases can support it. My third pick on my list, I have picked Flash Smite. I have changed my mind. Now it's one card. See, I'm picking, I'm picking half of Smite and half of Flash Fire <laughs> Fry. I keep wanting to say Flash Fire, but it's Flash Fry. Yeah, um, well, I think the the idea is that you're cooking a mandrake. It's so oh, it's, okay. Yeah, and flash fire is already a card, right? So I I I I I I'm I'm doing a little I'm doing a little bit of cheatiness here, but I'm I'm basically saying you know the two cost um, conditional ish removal spells are both good, right? I don't I don't really want to pick one over the other. If I had to, I probably would go for flash fry over smite, but um, but you know it's obviously context dependent on the deck or whatever. And then I guess I guess based on day one impressions, I'm gonna put Hephos in my number two slot. Hephos being the um, tradition, the time justice primal one two flyer for one with amplified do a bunch of things. And then finally, the number one card on my list, I have come, at least on day one impressions, I have come around to Volk being better than Hephos. I think Volk is really good. I think that there probably are enough ways to deal with it with things like Flash Fry. And turn one adjudicator's gavel when you're on the pl- when you're on the draw and your opponent just puts gavel on you randomly like that was brutal. But it's possible that Volk might be nerfed. I don't say that very often, and I've only played you know a couple games and it's day one impression. So who who even knows? Um, but like 
when I read Volk, I just assumed Volk's heart drew Volk out of the void, you know, and give it plus two, plus two. I was like, okay, you know, you get some long-term value. The fact that Volk's heart just straight up plays the Volk for three costs. Yes, you have to sacrifice a relic, but that's not even really that much of a downside because, you know, there's a number of, I mean, Okessa's audience, you know, you already got the plunder off Okessa's audience. You know, if you have two Volks, they just work with each other really well, especially when you rest rate of process in the future. Just the fact that, you know, it's just it's just so efficient to bring back the Volk. It's just really good, Sonny. It's just really good. <laughs> I don't feel like it's quite at the level where it would need to be nerfed, especially now that we're getting Flash Fry, and I think people are going to pay a lot more attention to Volk, like once it gets on people's radar. I did a brief glance at all the cards. I don't think any of these cards are nerf-worthy. I don't think we have any Shopkas in this set, but I like I could definitely see Volk just leading to a very repetitive play pattern. Like... You know, you have enough relics to to begin your game to to set up, and then you play your Volk, and then you just keep on playing Volk until your opponent dies. I understand your point, but if, if there was one card from the set that would be nerfed that you thought had the highest chance of being nerfed, would you say it's Volk? Yeah, it'd probably be Volk. I think the second closest <laughs> is Fort Smasher, just because of how swinging it is. But yeah, I think it would be Volk. Yes, it's just good. You guys should play it. What do you think the chances that Mid Chief Salus uh, gets nerfed to three one? Like, I think that's pretty likely. Ooh, a 3-1 mid cells. Um, I mean, if it being a 3-1, it wouldn't... I mean, I guess I guess the, the answer is, you know, Daryl loves making aggressive cards die to snowball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, all of the fire cards, uh, the Tota Pioneer, right? It was a 1-2, yeah. got nerfed to two uh, to a 1-1. One, one. Um, the Thunder of Wings was 4-2, now it's uh, now it's a 1-1. One, one. The Cut um, Purse? They, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like with a two two, now it's a two one. Yeah, yeah. So they they really like making fire cards X ones. It was an eight two, now it's an eight one. <laughs> with overwhelm. Um. Yeah, so like they really like giving it more of a weakness because like that's that's a type of thing that can be difficult to combat. Uh, I think that giving it one health wouldn't even be like compared to even those other cards, I don't think it's even that much of a downside because quick draw. It could be like a three, you know, negative two. And then if it, you know, didn't, if as long as it just didn't die until it was poked, I don't think it would really matter because um, quick draw means that you're not attacking it unless it, you know, uses the quick draw anyways for the most part. You're not attacking into a three, four without a combat trick. Unless you're bluffing, obviously, but that's a different story. Yeah, I actually think that might be slightly more likely than Volk, but... Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I think I think more people are going to pull their hair out from Volk than Mitchie Stellis. When Sonny's saying that he's basically saying that Mid Chief Salus is like a 2% chance of being nerfed, and Volk has like a 1.5% chance of being nerfed. You know, he's not being like one has a 40, one has a 50% chance. He's he's going low percentages here. Yes. I, I think it's more than 2%. But <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I think there's a fair chance that Mid Chief Salus is nerfed. You just look at what they've done with fire cards, and it would be <laughs> consistent if it was a 3 1. Like, Clodagh is also a 3 1. It would still be good. It would still be fantastic. I would still love to play it. Clodagh is so embarrassing, though. Anyway, so final piece of good news. I mean, cryptic good news. We have another announcement of an announcement from Scarlatch, this time with slightly more specific information than the Reddit post. This time we have a known uh, community member, Acer Asher, uh, who I think got second place at last week's Tuesday Night Eternal. So congratulations to them. They were asking about, you know, the timing release of the set, right? This was, this was in the wee hours of the morning. People were like, when is set release? I have drums! I have drum emojis on my side! Give me set! So then uh, Acer Asher said, but is the news about the new competitive season also almost there? And Scarlatch said, sounds like it'll be ready early next week. So I want to say Tuesday, but it could be Wednesday, or it could not be ready and then we could get it some later next week. Or maybe this is another soon and we'll get it two weeks from now. But if Scarlatch is on point, which we hopefully is, uh, then we have early next week which is exciting, right? Yeah, really looking forward to this. It'll give my life meaning again. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But uh, it will be awesome to have another competitive season. It also means the launch of the Team League. I'm still getting that set up, uh, talking to some people about it. Uh, there's going to be a cash prize. I'm not quite sure how much it's going to be, but it is going to be like a significant amount, like equal to a good finish at an ECQ um, for a team league that is going to go on during the next season. We just have to figure out exactly what's going on next season so we can mold the team league to match that. I'm super excited about it, and you should be too. And in preparation for that, 
you all should join the FE Discord, which is, and since things think Eternal is starting to come back up again, it's time to start plugging the Discord a bit more because um, it's the best place to be if you want to get better at competitive magic. Not magic. Why is <laughs> I haven't played magic in like five, like I haven't played magic in like six years. Um, okay, I will admit, I have been enjoying watching some Tybalt trickery and Tybalt cascade videos just because I think it's really dumb and I like watching the really dumb stuff. Um, and I like watching him complain about things as well because that's always fun. Um, God, I, I I haven't played Magic in so long. Honestly, Magic, oh my God. I don't even know where I was with that. Anyways, join, join the discard, whatever. The, okay, like before I started playing Eternal, I was not, well, I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't say I was terrible at Magic. I won an SCG Open, but I got a lot better at Magic through playing Eternal. Although that probably predates the Discord, to be honest. Um, I, I I spent a long time not playing Magic, and then I qualified for my first Pro Tour after like two years of just Eternal. So um, you know that 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 assertion you made earlier might be true after all. I mean, I mean, I guess it is sort of true. I think if I did go back to Magic, which I have no intention of, oh, yeah, but if I no did, way. I probably would be better at Magic now with with after my experience through that. Now there are different games, uh, and you know different ways I have to learn about sideboarding again. Um, but um, you know, like in Magic, I was I was nowhere near close to you know the level of Game Plan Eternal. Um, but yeah, I mean, in a sense, you know, like I would probably better at magic for my time spent during Eternal. But anyways, yeah, this crappy Discord, it's a good place to be. Now that things are picking back up again, especially when the the uh, announcement comes out, there'll be a, probably hopefully more discussion going on. And it's also where that uh, that Team Fantasy League will come into play. So check it out. Maybe, hopefully. Ignore my speaking blunders for magic. <laughs> All right, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much to our patrons, Pre Ribbon, Cutillion, Work Done Sun, Chrissier, Camomilk, D Dub, and Yeast Out for sustaining FE Cast. If you would like to join these folks in making FE Cast possible and gaining the privilege of having your name read out at the end of every episode, wow, that sounds conceited. Uh, you can go to <laughs> patreon.com slash friends of eternal and uh, potentially donate. And finally, a big thank you to SRFS for editing our show and putting it up each week because uh, that's a lot of work. So thank you to them. All right. Uh, yeah, we will see you next week, hopefully with news of what the competitive season is going to look like for this next year. Uh, so we will be on that as quickly as possible when it comes out. Uh, thanks again for listening. Until next time, we will see you in the friend zone. The Friends of Eternal Discord is the best place on the internet to get better at Eternal. We have players of all skill and experience levels all happy to help each other out on basically any aspect of their Eternal gameplay. And making all this possible is our generous patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support FECast or Friends of Eternal, consider donating at Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll see you in the Friends Zone.